No place quite embodies the American West like the state of Utah. From its impressive vistas to Red Rock Towers, the Beehive State has made the perfect backdrop for Hollywood Westerns. However, in the northern part of the state, there are mountains that rise out of the desert. These are the High Uintas, our ultimate destination for research. Moab, Utah is famous for its red rocks. Covered in a layer of iron oxide particles, the rocks turned red when these particles reacted to the oxygen around them. After leaving the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, Eli and I made our way through Moab and explored the unique environment of that area. Adding to the uniqueness of Utah is the impressive record of dinosaur fossils and tracks found all over the state. Check this out, we got uh, dinosaur print fossils. You got the three toes right here, second one right there. How cool is that, just preserved here. There's also one here, it's a little less visible. One right here and one right there, I believe. And uh, there's some petroglyphs around here too, so we're gonna try and find that. Just a little ways up from the dinosaur track right down there, we've got these awesome petroglyphs. I have to read the sign, but I mean, that one's really cool with the horns. Obviously they're pretty delicate. Try not to touch them or anything, but man, it's pretty cool to see. I wonder how, you know, how many thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago they were put here. These tracks have dated back to the early Jurassic period, roughly 190 million years ago. Through a combination of geological changes, building up and breaking down the soil over millions of years, many layers of prehistoric sediment have risen to the surface, bringing with it fossils and tracks from those eras. After a brief stay in Moab, we headed up to Vernal, Utah to learn more about some of the prehistoric animals of the state.
Utah Field Museum in Vernal, Utah, came to see some of the dinosaur exhibits and the lady working the desk notices Eli's got a Bigfoot on his shirt, asks are we Bigfoot hunters? We kind of say yeah. She said her cousin swears up and down she saw a Bigfoot on the Green River. Uh, she said 10, 13 miles from here. It's kind of a brushy environment so pretty cool. We came to look for dinos and we get uh, a Bigfoot report so Utah I guess has a lot of Squatch reports so that's pretty cool. While certainly interesting from a natural history perspective, as a Bigfooter, all the remnants of the prehistoric world beg one of the most hotly debated questions of Sasquatch research. Where are the bones? Looking back into the fossil record of other apes, we find that many of them do not leave many fossils, if any. For example, gorilla and chimpanzee fossils are limited to a handful of teeth, and they are largely absent from the fossil record until very recently. One reason for this is the environments that these apes live in. Forested, wet, and teeming with life, unlike the desert. So with that said, we departed for the High Uintas, an environment that might be conducive for something primate -like. Eli and I would be hiking six plus miles into the Uintas to find a secluded spot away from campers and hikers, and to perhaps have our own Sasquatch encounter. Just stopped for a little break here. Heard something strange. Like a rock clack of some kind. It almost sounded like a branch snap. Yeah. I mean, could be a moose maybe? Elk? There's a lot of things. Yeah. It's weird, it was like right as I was about to pick the camera up. <laughs> yeah. That was weird. Well, either way, I was just filming a thing saying we're taking a little break here. We're about to head up towards the lake. Packs feels really nice to take them off. Balance obviously feels yeah. all messed up now, but yeah, maybe we should just start walking up there, see what that noise is. Yeah. You wanna? Yeah, let's do it. All right, well, let's continue then. Let's go into the spooky forest. I guess there was a hail 
dust on yesterday. It hasn't melted yet. That's cool. Well, whew. how you feeling, dude? I'm tired. Yeah, this is definitely tough. We're uh, we're almost there. We've got about a mile left, so. It was at this point, as we hiked on in the darkness of the forest, both tired and hungry, but singing to keep our spirits up, that we were abruptly stopped in our tracks by a loud crash in the trees close by. You hear that? Uh -huh. How loud that was? Dude. You wanna take our packs off here? Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm getting... Wow, that was freaking loud. Go lights off. That was crazy. That was really loud. Yep. Caught me off guard. your reaction it was something loud and something breaking right in there yep it was uh right as we're walking yeah, I know. typical Weird. Something strange. Did you hear that? Mm hmm. Bro. What? Look at this. What is that? Why is it flashing?
dead quiet out here. It is. That's what's so weird about it. Man. Well, both times it's happened when we've been talking or doing something. But I noticed the past two times we had our lights off for a bit and then we turned them on and that's yeah. when it happened. So maybe the lights off for a bit. Yeah. All right, so we originally were gonna hike to the lake. It's still, a bit, it's only about a mile away, but given we've had some weird stuff going on, could be anything, but I mean, it was coming from different directions. It's super silent right now. We're, we found a little clearing. We're just gonna set up here for the night, make our way to the lake tomorrow. So, I mean, we're all tucked in here, a little bit warmer. Now it's nice. It was just kind of strange, those seeming coincidences with the knocking sounds, right? Oh yeah, dude. And it, right when I went to do a, a knock before we got into the tent, another sound like that, right? Kind of, kind of a knock, right before you knocked. Yeah, so. Which is weird. Strange, so we're tucked in now, but we'll, uh, Turn the camera on if anything else happens, but other than that, we're just going to kind of chill. It was a relatively windless night. The audio recorder didn't pick up any wildlife, movement, or loud sounds, aside from a few stick-breaking type noises, which were nowhere near as loud as what we heard while hiking. It was mostly deathly quiet. Alright, well, it's morning. This location is incredible. As soon as we woke up, we saw these mountains right around. Let's see another one, the shadow of one right in there with some snow up at the top. We'll have to see that when we get towards the lake. But we're gonna look around. Let me see if we can't find anything, any tracks or anything right in this immediate area. So if you wanna be silent here, you totally can. Ready, let's do it again. I'm gonna walk from over here you put the camera just in there and then I'll tell you, I'll, I'll let you know when I'm closer. See if you can hear me walk up at all. Okay. Hey. <laughs> See? Did you hear me? You totally snuck Walked up on all me. all the way around. I snuck up, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Uh, we're gonna try to recap. Basically, we're walking up the trail here, right? Were you in front of me at that point? No, I was behind. So I'm in front, walking right here, and right from that direction I hear, you know, what sounds like a pretty loud knock. How, how would you describe it, Eli? Yeah, just a knock. So we immediately put our packs down over here, start doing some knocks against this little tree here. We're hanging out for a little bit here. We go lights off, we get the night vision. We hear something faint coming from that direction, just like a small one. At that point the camera was rolling. A few minutes go by, we then hear two pretty loud ones come down from this way, and we have that one on audio. And I'll play it after I'm talking right now. But so it came from right down in that direction. So I'd say we just go down there and kind of see, because that's where two of those, or three, I guess, of the noises that we heard came from. So that was three. The fourth one that we could hear was out at camp. Right before I was about to do a knock, I heard another sort of knock from this same direction. The camp's right over there right before I was about to strike, which is kind of odd. But um, I thought I maybe heard some during the night. I don't know, we'll have to check the audio. Let's go in there. It's kind of open down here. All right, so in terms of ruling out, you know, other things. So first of all, what about wind? I don't think it was that windy that it could have done that. And it was seemingly 
coordinated or not coincidental. So then you're pretty much left with wildlife. There's moose in here. So, I mean, that's a possibility. Maybe moose breaking some sticks or something. I don't know. We, you can't automatically jump to the Sasquatch conclusion, of course. Moose, elk, uh, mountain lion. I don't know if they would exactly do that. I'd probably lean towards something more uh, undulate, elk or moose, something like that, than I would a mountain lion doing something of that nature. So, tough to say. All right, so I'm gonna go down to the spot where we heard those noises from. You're gonna stay here, Eli, and let's see if we can recreate it or gauge what sound. So I'll go down there. Hmm. Sounded Good. The first one sounded a lot like it. I think the second one might have been closer, dude. Might have been closer? Yeah. Something down in there. And we wouldn't be able to see that with the night vision. No, definitely not. <laughs> you can imagine something lives out here. They know exactly where we're going as humans on the trail. This is a pretty used trail to the lake. But, I mean, there's a couple camps around here, but I don't imagine people camp too too often in this area well as we so often like to do and deploy us a pheromone chip leave it in the area while we're gone for the day our plan is basically we're gonna come back camp here in the evening we're gonna go explore and check out other stuff during the day we're gonna leave an audio recorder pheromone chip so let's go set that up okay here we go there in that branch. It's on hold. Like right here. Okay, do that. Is it recording? Yep. Alright, so we got our audio deployed right here. Isn't that funny? It's like just propped up in there. See, it's like kind of wrapped around. How the hell do you get that in there? What do you say we get the uh, drone up? Check out what this area looks like. Yeah. tell with the drone there's a couple of uh, like wide open areas river nearby it's good for food resources plenty of cover and there's lots of trees we're basically in a giant bowl here yeah so it's oh look here's another little lake or pond or something yeah this is behind us here yep right at, right up against the wall Maybe that's where that trail goes to. You got your thermos on? I do. So, uh... You want to get some water here? Well, we've made it to 
beautiful, incredible amethyst lake. Look at this place. This natural little bowl valley. Wow. I think you lie. Sick. Pretty much had Amethyst Lake completely to ourselves today. Been amazing. Got the drone up right now, but uh, just what a what a place, man. So we're about to uh, start hiking on back to a different lake. Maybe hike up a little further on a mountain, but last uh, last view here. Just want to check it out. See that blue blue water. Incredible. So this is the end of the line. This valley, you've got other mountains just over the ridges. Obviously we came in from that way. Very wooded, lots of animal sign. Whatever happened last night with that knocking. Another horrible lunch view. It's just awful. So I'm waiting here for food to uh, be done. But I uh, figured we'd have a little conversation about Bigfoot at higher altitudes. Mm. I mean, my thoughts are there's reports from areas like this. We're, we're plus 10,000 feet right now. There are reports in these higher elevation areas. And uh, I, I think it makes sense. You have other wildlife in here. You got moose, deer, mountain lion, bear in some areas. This area connects to the lower valleys. Maybe it's cooler up here in the summers. Yep. Maybe moving up in this area. I don't know, what do you think? I think there's a precedent for it. I mean, like you said, a lot of large animals live at higher elevations. Yeah. There's a lot of food, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of shelter. Yeah. You know, we're kind of out in the open, so we keep getting hit by the wind. But yeah, a lot of places to hide, and uh, like you said, yep. take shelter. Most reports come from mountainous areas, obviously, disregarding reports in southern US, you know flat areas but right. woods I mean you have woods around here all these national forests out here in the west I mean that's where the majority of these reports are coming from from these kinds of areas there is a report from this re this area the mirror lakes area mm. definitely we'll read it later I found it online found it pretty interesting here we go then We just hiked a little bit ways up there, just to about this ledge right there on Osler Peak. Nice little peak of this area. Absolutely amazing. Look at that. Down into the valley, our camp is somewhere down in that tree line. You can probably see into Wyoming over there. That's where we came in from. Another lake right in that area. But we're heading home for the night.
All right, well, we're just getting back to camp. And it appears our tent has been flipped over. Rain flies off over there. What? I mean, to be fair, it was I really. I don't think there was much weight to it. Yeah, it was really windy too. Yeah, it probably blew over by itself. But either way, that's a fortunate discovery. Was like this, right? Yeah. Oh look, it's already moving again. Yeah, so we can tell. Probably was a natural occurrence. I thought somebody else had set up a tent next to ours because I see this green tent awning. I'm like, whose tent is that? Seeing anything? No. Audio recorder still going. Oh, sick. It's been eight hours and 17 minutes since we came. Cool. Ball cut. Cool. Oh, we've been out for eight hours. Crazy. Doesn't appear to be any tracks of anything. Pheromone chip appears unmolested. Still stinky. I can barely smell it, but. Our smell isn't that good anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're just kind of sitting here. At least we got a lot of time to hang out and think. We're not hiking, so we've been having a lot of discussions about the topic of Bigfoot, Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. Since this trip has involved a lot of fossils, bones, as we saw in Vernal and dinosaur. Monument, Moab, all these places have a lot of fossil evidence. Desert, obviously it's not a desert environment. Yeah. But bones come up a lot. Mm. They do, and and the one of the main questions that's always asked about this subject is, where are the bones? Yeah, that's and it's a fair question. I mean, people that are skeptical or people that just don't really believe that there is something like Bigfoot, always asking, you know, how come we don't have any bones? And that's a fair question, something that I point to usually is uh, pretty interesting is Gigantopithecus. Now yeah. I'm not necessarily saying I think Sasquatch is Gigantopithecus. A lot of people may fall in that camp. Whatever. I'm just talking about Gigantopithecus without the Bigfoot topic. So just remove it for a second. Gigantopithecus was one of the largest apes in history that we know of. Uh, basically a huge orangutan looking mm. kind of ape uh, lived in China, would have interacted with early humans possibly 100,000 years ago, maybe even more recently. The only bones, the only fossil evidence we have that it even existed are some teeth and part of a jawbone. And that's the largest ape in history. Mm -hmm. That thing was like King Kong, basically. Right. And that's the only fossil evidence we have. It only happened because they discovered teeth bones in Chinese apothecary shops many years ago, which I think is really interesting. So that's something I point to. The largest ape we don't have great fossil evidence of it. We, we barely have anything aside from what's in the mouth, which I think is pretty mind-blowing considering the size of this thing and how they're able to create projections. So certain parts of North America, like the desert, yeah, they might preserve fossils from millions of years ago, but what about these kinds of environments where the reports are coming from? Mm. Are they as conducive for fossils? You know, finding elk or mountain lion or bear, all kinds of other bones, doesn't really happen all that often. Mm. So... Definitely something interesting, but I think the Gigantopithecus example is one that makes me curious. You know, why can't, why can't we have more bones for, for Gigantopithecus? Right. I don't know. I don't know, but what do you think? So, I mean, the bones here in the forest, they, they kind of disintegrate pretty quickly. There's a lot of bottom feeders. You got things that eat it, porcupines, all kinds of critters. Right. But what about reports of Sasquatch burying their dead? I, I've never personally heard of a report. I think that's largely speculation mm. by the part of Bigfoot enthusiasts and researchers. To me, it kind of would seem to make sense if these things are as intelligent as they are. Why would they just leave one of their own dead laying there? Doesn't seem to make sense to me. Now people will say, oh, that's a cop-out. Fair enough. 
Maybe it is. You know, maybe it's our way of conveniently explaining away something that's inconvenient. If these things are as smart as they are and able to avoid humans as the, in the ways that they are for so long, with really only minimal evidence and anecdotal stories, why wouldn't they bury their dead? That's just a question I would pose. Right. It seems to make sense to me, but maybe that's just because I'm so immersed in this subject for so long uh, that hopefully I'm not too biased, but it just kind of logically it makes sense. I don't know. What do you think? No, I think it makes sense. You're talking about something with, you know, incredible hiding skills on top of that supposed language. We think they have a language, you know, which indicates some level of intelligence beyond like an elk or a deer or something, yeah. you know? So as soon as you start talking, it, the shape of the brain changes and the way you interact with the world changes. And I, a lot of early human or humanoid ancestors, they buried their dead as well. I think yeah. there's evidence of Neanderthals burying their dead. Right. You know? And now we ask you, the listener, what do you believe? Here we are, we're chilling obviously. Last night here in the Hayuintas. I guess since we haven't really interviewed any eyewitnesses or talked to any local researchers for this project, I figured it might be cool to read a report. You don't really hear a lot from this area, so without further ado, I'm just gonna read the report. So this is something I got on a website called Backcountry Post. I believe it was posted in 2015, so. At the risk of being denounced by some, I'd like to offer this subject for discussion. Have you in your hiking slash camping experience ever cr come across an event that can't be explained? There are a lot of people on the site that have covered the Uintas on foot and otherwise for years. Have you heard tales or better yet s seen something? I have. I wonder if there are many more like me on this site. Here's my story. In the late 1970s, while working for the BSA Camp Steiner, the Mirror Lake area, I encountered what I believe was a Bigfoot. This is the Mirror Lake area. Oh, wow. Just, just for context. Further in, but in general area. So here we go. On Monday and Friday nights at the scout camp, there was always a camp-wide campfire held on the far side of the lake. Two large fires would be built and a program offered for entertainment, recognition, and education. The camp sits in a beautiful bowl and there's a natural echo there. We, the camp staff, use this echo to great advantage at the Friday night close of the campfire program by playing taps on multiple trumpets stationed around the lake. I played a trumpet back then and frequently got the mission of hiking to a point distant from the campfire bowl and awaiting a flashlight signal to start the taps echo. I'd see the signal, play the first few bars of the tune, and across the lake another horn would join in. The echoes would come back to us, producing what sounded like taps in four-part harmony. As the campfire program was coming to a close for the night, I gathered up to trumpet and made my way out to a small rock ledge that jutted out into the lake about 200 yards from the campfire bowl. There were, at the time, approximately 350 scouts and adult leaders assembled there. Of some note, it ought to be mentioned that the program was not a quiet one. There was singing, laughter, and all manner of noise at a scout campfire. It was a typical Uinta night, crisp and clear, with acceptable starlight to navigate with. We preferred to set this echo off without giving away our movement to the scouts, and another trumpet player had departed the fire about 20 minutes before me, heading in the opposite direction along the shore. Arriving early at the rock ledge at the water's edge, I could see the light of the two dying fires back at the bowl. Surrounded by water in front of me, and tall pines and a steep glacial slope behind me, the width of a footpath separating the two elements, I began to silently blow warm air into my horn to warm it up. I watched and waited for the signal. Have you ever been stared at from behind? That uncomfortable somebody's watching me feeling? That intangible sensation of another's eyes upon your back? That became so powerful that when you turn to meet the person's gaze instantly? That is what happened to me. Standing on that little rock ledge in the dark, I became uncomfortable as I waited. Something was out there. There had been reports of a cougar near camp, but I dismissed that out of hand given all the noise possibility of another scout lurking on the hillside above to me came to mind. 
It didn't feel like that. Something was looking at me. The hair on my neck began to raise. I turned towards the trees and a scant eight feet behind me and saw it. Standing between two widely spaced trees on the opposite side of the path, grasping the slender pines, stood a creature my mind could not wrap around. I felt a mixture of sheer terror and wonder. So sudden into my life was the omnipresent, undeniable creature standing before me. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. The creature I saw towered over me. I'm six foot one, and I'd say he was eight feet tall. He was dark in color, heavy in body and bulk, hairy so much that I could perceive hair hanging down from his arms as he grasped the trees. And he was swaying back and forth from left to right between the tree trunks with his hands. Instinctively, I knew this thing could toss me around and break me in half with little effort, but it made no aggressive move towards me. I looked straight into this thing's eyes and he back into mine. There was a soul in there, in my opinion. Then, from the corner of my view, I saw the flashlight signal from the campfire. Distracted from this unfathomable thing before me by an outside light, I really can't explain what, what went on in my mind at that moment, I lifted my horn to my lips and decimated the silence with the first loud, clear, resonant note that began the tune called Taps, and the creature disappeared, vanishing behind the darkness and the trees in the hillside above me. There are those who question why I didn't get a plaster cast of a footprint. We searched and found none. For the same reason, 300 scouts in a week are hard pressed to make a single cast of a deer print there. The area is a glacial carve out and castable deep prints in the immediate area are not as available as one might suspect. I know what I saw. I know there are those who won't believe me. The duration of my contact with this creature lasted about as long as it did for you to read its description. The story I've just told is true, and it's my first person account of what I believe was a genuine Bigfoot sighting in the Uintas. Wow. So, pretty interesting. Very detailed, obviously. Yeah. They uh, got a pretty good look at it. Um, what interested me immediately with that report was the swaying between the trees. I mean, that's something that comes up time and time again. Right. That's uh, like a very common Bigfoot motif at this point. Yeah. Swaying between the trees, trying to kind of get a better look at you. I mean, Jill in the previous episode reported something similar. Shane. Yep. You know. So Just multiple people we've interviewed have said the same thing. So that, that speaks to some sort of a, a behavior right. that a species would exhibit, mm. which is really interesting. And that happened, obviously, in the 1970s in this region, differing from where Jill had her experience and, and very far from where the, the woods of Oregon where Shane had had his experience. So. Right. And another thing, too, he brings up the finding tracks and how it's difficult. Yep. Because we experienced that today. Yeah. Unless it's directly like in the mud. In the trail in the mud, yeah. And how, how silently you can walk in this area. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was able to sneak up on that tent. Yep. And yeah, so there you have it. Uh, I guess a genuine Uintas Bigfoot report. It was another deathly quiet night. There were no sounds of wildlife or anything for that matter. Due to a forest-wide fire ban at the time, we sat in the darkness most of the evening, looking in the immediate area around camp, but otherwise settling in without incident. Another morning here. But I think uh, this is given us our last morning. We're going to take a little walk further off up until the valley wall, basically where the mountain starts, and just see, see what's going on in that area. What's so cool about this valley is if you had a few weeks or maybe a month, you could scour the whole area back and forth. You have obviously mountains on either side, so you could concentrate on this area and I'm sure you'd run into all kinds of wildlife. Probably even maybe something Sasquatch related.
What's up? I think it was up on the hill. Sounded like it was coming from down the hill, but. I mean, chances are, whatever it was, probably hurt us as we came towards it, took off. We wouldn't hurt anything because we're too busy crunching on sticks and being loud humans. So that was two responses. Yep. What other animal would do that? It's not a woodpecker, we've heard him. <clears throat> Start heading back. Sure. Looking back on it, I regret that we did not push further on to see what might be ahead, or even at least just launch the drone in that area, but sadly it was back at camp. At the moment, while in unfamiliar and truly wild country, maybe it was the altitude or a sense of frustration that sent us back to camp. In the end, if Sasquatch were truly in the area, they remained just out of sight. The area is certainly a suitable habitat for such creatures with plenty of places to hide. The Hayuintas of Utah may warrant another visit in the future, but for now, the quest continues beyond the trail.